Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast with Dr. Brett Scher. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig is a pediatric endocrinologist, recently retired from clinical practice at UCSF, but still very active in research and now even having gone to get a master's of law from Hastings College so that he can get more involved into the public policy side of things because his whole life... He's been fighting childhood obesity, and he's been studying the CNS regulation of energy balance. But he knows it's more than science that is affecting this because this is blown up in front of his eyes. He has seen this epidemic of obesity and diabetes take place as he's been practicing. And he's realized that it's going to take more than science. It's going to take public policy to halt this and reverse it. And that's what makes this such an interesting discussion. He has such a great depth of knowledge of the history of public policies, of analogous scenarios of public policy, and how we can use that information to try and help us stem this, this epidemic that we're in the middle of. And what can we define as the possible causes? Fructose, glucose, sucrose, sugar, all these terms get thrown around as if they're one thing. Well, we talk a little bit about that to identify the specifics of it and also just the processed food and how that plays into it as well, the so-called healthy natural fruit juices. So I really enjoyed this discussion with with Robert because he has he has such a great grasp on both the science and the public policy and how to help us draw a roadmap on how to get out of this and reverse it. So I really hope you enjoy this discussion. And in the end, he he lists the different ways to get in touch with him. He's involved in for-profits and non-profits. He's ri- written a number of books. So definitely stay tuned to the end so you can learn all the things he's involved in. And if you want to hear more, because there's a lot more that he has to say and has produced that is very worthwhile to read and listen to. So enjoy this interview with Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Robert Lustig, thank you so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast today. My pleasure, but it's Rob to you. Rob, you got it. Thank you. Now, in your career, you have seen this just epidemic rise in front of your face as a, as a pediatric endocrinologist. I mean, it's one thing, I've said this before, it's one thing for me to see diabetes in adults and the consequences that happen in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, but to see it in a pediatric population with type 2 diabetes and now non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I mean, this, is, this must be heartbreaking to see in kids, and you've seen it just explode. Yeah. I mean... I went into pediatrics to stay away from chronic disease, and now that's all I do. I went into pediatric endocrinology to take care of short kids, and they got fat on me. They grew horizontally right. rather than vertically, <laughs> <laughs> and and it happened on my watch. And you know, I mean, they're coming in, and for every patient I take care of, ten more show up on the doorstep. You know, something is wrong, and everybody, you know, of course, knows that something's wrong, but everyone seems to have a different answer for what's wrong. And, and that's we can't what, tie it together. Right, and that's what has really halted any progress. All these different voices, different theories, without a unifying approach has, has just really made it so we can't make any progress. Plus, unfortunately, some of the stakeholders in this discussion have money associated with it. So there are dark forces actually trying to maintain the status quo. Well, tell me some more about that. Well, uh, we can go on for hours, but the fact of the matter is the food industry has a vested interest and have pulled out all the stops in the same way that tobacco did. Um, Marion Nessel just released this week a book called Un- Unsavory Truth. My colleagues Asim Hotra and Grant Schofield and I published an article earlier this year that the science against sugar alone is not enough to win the battle against obesity and type 2 diabetes, opposition from vested interests must be taken first. Hmm. So we know who's on the other side. And the problem is that the other side has a very large mouthpiece and a whole bunch of money. Right. A lot more money than scientists and universities and physicians, certainly as individuals and even trying to group together. Um, Indeed. Can't come close. So we're, we're doing our best. Yeah. Uh, the good news is we've got the science uh, and the science is very potent, but um, you know, not everyone's a scientist. Yeah. Sometimes not even scientists are scientists. 
Now you're on you're on record as basically saying that fructose is probably the number one concern. I'm not going to say that. You're not going to say that. I'm not going to say it's the number one concern. Okay. Okay. Trans fats used to be the number one concern, but we figured that out. It took 25 years to figure it out and finally get rid of it. Which shows how shows how slow the needle moves on these. Well, because there were dark forces there as well. Absolutely. Now I think that sugar is not the cause of obesity, diabetes, fatty liver disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is the most malleable. It is the one that is the low hanging fruit. It is the one that it's added to other foods specifically for the food industry's purposes. Therefore, it is the easiest one to attack and target uh, upfront. Now, do you think it's most important to target sugar or to differentiate it between fructose, glucose, sucrose, and sort of break it down? Well, to be honest with you, they're the same thing. Yeah. Um, once you understand what these different chemicals do in the body, that is glucose and fructose, they are not the same. You know, they, the food industry will tell you, you know, 11 ways from Sunday, uh, a sugar is a sugar. It is absolutely, completely fallacious, and it's disingenuous to boot. Uh, they are not handled the same, glucose and fructose. Now, as it turns out, sucrose, high fructose corn syrup, agave, maple syrup, honey, are all basically equivalent. They're all half glucose, half fructose. Now, glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. And we know that because the Inuit who ate whale blubber, who didn't ever see a piece of bread or grow a you know, strand of wheat, you know, still had a serum glucose level. Um, William R. Stephenson and his assistant, the famous Arctic explorer, checked himself into Bellevue in 1928, and they ate nothing but meat for one year on their clinical research center. They still had a serum glucose level, and they were a hell of a lot healthier than everybody else. Yeah. So the notion that you need sugar to live or that you even need glucose to live is disingenuous. You need a blood glucose to live, that is true. You don't need dietary glucose to live because it's so important that your liver will make it. It will make it out of amino acids or fatty acids as needed. So glucose is essential. It is just not essential to eat. Fructose on the other hand, there is no biochemical reaction in any eukaryotic organism that requires it. It is completely vestigial. And when consumed in excess, because of its unique metabolism, does three things that glucose does not do. One, it drives liver fat accumulation faster than virtually any other item on the planet. Number two, it engages in the Maillard or the aging reaction. Now glucose does it too, but fructose does it seven times faster. And it turns out there is a metabolite of fructose that does it 250 times faster. And we're working on that. Uh, and number three, fructose rather than glucose stimulates the reward center of the brain. And therefore we have the data that shows that the fructose molecule of sugar is what makes it addictive. So is it addictive? Does it meet classification of addicti addiction and therefore should it be regulated as an addictive component? So first of all, addictive substances are not regulated all by themselves. Otherwise, Starbucks would be out of business. <laughs> okay. And if you take my Starbucks away from me, I will kill you. Okay. I'll lay off that's my, that's my addiction. Okay. I'm not proud of it, but you know, at least it's socially acceptable this week. How many of you had this morning? Uh, three. Okay. And I need my fourth. Okay. <laughs> um, so the fact that it's addictive is not the reason for regulation. However, when something is both toxic and addictive and ubiquitous and has detrimental effects on society, <clears throat> then it meets the public health criteria for regulation. In fact, sugar does meet those criteria. So how is sugar addictive? In 2012, sugar was not addictive. In 2013, sugar was addictive. What's the difference? So what changed? Right. Sugar changed? No. The definition changed. Ah. So the American Psychiatric Association, they are the umpire. They call the balls and strikes. 
on things like addiction. And they had to add gambling <clears throat> as an addiction. It, was, it became very clear that behavioral addictions went through the same um, CNS process, caused the same problems, and had to be dealt with in the same ways as chemical addictions. Now, up till 2013, the DSM-4 said you needed two things for addiction. You needed tolerance and withdrawal. Now, tolerance is the effect of these substances on downregulation of dopamine receptors. Right, because which is why you need more and more over more time. More and more to get, get less and less. Right. More and more to get less and less. That's this phenomenon called tolerance. Now, the second criterion that the APA said you had to have for addiction was withdrawal. Now, it turns out withdrawal, which is true for all the chemical addictive substances, those are all effects that occur systemically on the body, not on the brain. So caffeine withdrawal has effects on the heart, it has effects on the vasculature, it has effects on sweat glands, etc. Um, opioids have effects on the GI tract, have effects on the heart, etc. They all have these effects that you can feel and they cause withdrawal. Now, gambling is not a chemical. Hmm. Gambling does not affect the body, but it sure does affect the brain. And in order to be able to provide clinical services under an addiction paradigm, the American Psychiatric Association had to change the definition. So when they uh, broke out the DSM-5 in 2013, and they do this every 20 years, now the definition could be tolerance and withdrawal or tolerance and dependence. Uh. Now, there's nine criteria for dependence. We don't have time for each one. You can look them up. They're online. And gambling meets all of them. Gaming disorder meets all of them. Social media meets all of them. Shopping meets all of them. <laughs> oh, Pornography meets all of them. And guess what? Sugar meets all of them too. So we have substance addictions and we also have behavioral addictions. And sugar happens to be a substance that induces both tolerance and dependence. Anyone who says, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth, they're a sugar yeah. addict. But is, is knowing that enough to change public policy or to change people, certainly not enough to change people's activities on their own and change their decisions. So, so what else has to be in place for us to be able to say, this is a public health crisis that we need to intervene upon? Well, we have two templates to look at, tobacco and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So for years, smoking was a liberty interest. You know, you had a liberty interest to smoke. You know, Bory Alley v. Axelrod, a famous New York State Supreme Court case, said you have a liberty interest to smoke. Well, you know what? The New York State Legislature, understanding what the problem was and understanding that the uh, tobacco industry was disingenuous, started passing laws that said you can't smoke in bars, you can't smoke in atria, you can't smoke in restaurants, you can't smoke in schools, you can't smoke in hospitals, okay? And now you can't even smoke in your car if there's a kid in it. So, you know, the fact, and, and the thing is, when it first started coming out, people were yelling nanny state, nanny state. Yeah. They're not doing that anymore. Well, part of that though is because if I'm smoking here, I'm going to affect you. Exactly. If I'm drinking my Coca-Cola here, that's not going to affect you. Oh, yes, it is. It'll affect you how? Mon monetarily. Because you, uh, if I have to go to the emergency room, I won't be able to get in because there will be gurneys filled with people with sugar beverage associated heart disease waiting for their coronary bypasses or their TPA. And there won't be any money in the system for me to be able to access that health care in the first place. Medicare will be broke by the year 2026. Social Security will be broke by the year 2034 because of this. So this, while it is not an assault on your person, like tobacco is or like alcohol is in terms of car accidents, it is an assault on your person in terms of your economy. Now, you could argue that's not the same, but the fact of the matter is we still have to deal with it the same. Right. And our society is not good at seeing that next step. We're very good at seeing the immediate. We are. And the reason is because we're all addicted. <laughs> Addiction is about now, okay? And happiness is about the future. It's about 
basically making life better for later. So we are into reward. We are not into happiness. We are into instant gratification. We are not into delayed gratification. Now we doctors, <clears throat> we know everything about delayed gratification because we went through med school, residency, fellowship, et cetera. And we delayed you know, being able to see any money or any you know, even patient care you know, on our own for what, 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years. We know everything there is to know about delayed gratification. The fact of the matter is the American public does not. And, and a lot of that has to do with industry and what has been put in front of us in terms of choices we can make. And we are an on-demand society. We are an instant gratification society. And that's we not are, something that's going to be easy to fix. We are a dopamine society. Yeah. That is what it is. Okay. It is dopamine. Call it what it is. So this is why I wrote this book, you know, The Hacking of the American Mind, <clears throat> is to differentiate these two phenomena one called pleasure, one called happiness, mm -hmm. okay? Washington, D.C., Las Vegas, Madison Avenue, Wall Street, Silicon Valley have confused and conflated these two terms on purpose because then they can, quote, sell you happiness. Mm -hmm. They can sell you pleasure, no pleasure. argument there. They can sell you reward. They can sell you immediate gratification. I have no problem you know, saying that. The question is, are they selling you happiness? And the fact of the matter is, they're actually taking away your happiness. So what are the difference between these two terms, yeah. pleasure and happiness? There are seven. Number one, pleasure is short-lived, happiness is long-lived. Two, pleasure is visceral, you feel it in your body, like all of those substances having those systemic effects. Uh, uh, happiness is ethereal, you feel it above the neck. Pleasure is taking, happiness is giving. Pleasure is experienced alone. Happiness is usually experienced in social groups. Pleasure can be achieved with substances. Happiness cannot be achieved with substances. The extremes of pleasure, whether it be substances or behavior, so substances, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, uh, 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 opioids, uh, heroin, uh, sugar, or behaviors, uh, shopping, gambling, internet, social media, porn, in the extreme, all lead to addiction. There's an aholic next to every one of those. Uh, right. Okay. Shopaholic, sexaholic, alcoholic, chocoholic, you know, down the list. There's no happy aholic. There's no happy aholic. You can't be overdosed on too much happiness. Don't exist. And then finally, number seven, pleasure is dopamine, happiness is serotonin. Hmm. Now, why do we care? Why does it matter? Here's why dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Every time dopamine is released, crosses the synapse, binds to its receptors on the next neuron, the neuron fires. It excites the next neuron. Now, neurons like to be excited. That's why they have receptors. But they like to be tickled, not bludgeoned. Chronic overstimulation of any neuron anywhere in the body will lead to neuronal cell death. And we know this because kids who have chronic long-term seizure disorders and status epilepticus have to be rushed to the ICU and we have to stop their seizures because the longer the seizures go on, the more brain damage occurs. So we know this. Now, that second neuron that's receiving the dopamine signal, it doesn't want to die. It wants to protect itself. So it has a fail-safe. It has a plan B. What it does is it downregulates the number of receptors so that there's less chance statistically, you know, through the law of mass action, that any given molecule of dopamine will find a receptor. Makes sense. Thereby reducing the gain. Right. So what does this mean in human terms? You get a hit, you get a rush, receptors go down. Next time you need a bigger hit to get the same rush, receptors go down. Then a bigger hit, bigger hit, bigger hit, until finally you need a huge hit to get nothing. That's called tolerance. And then when the neurons actually do start to die, that's called addiction. Hmm. And guess what? When those neurons die, ain't coming back. Right. Which is why addiction is so hard to treat. And now when we talk about sugar, you had mentioned that fructose specifically has this addictive property more so than glucose itself. Right. Well, so fructose... When you do the fMRI studies, and one of those studies was done by your previous guest, David Ludwig uh, and Kara Eblen, uh, specifically stimulates the reward center, the nucleus accumbens, that part of the limbic system. Turns out glucose does not. Right. Now, glucose is a little sweet, 
you know? Glucose has a sweetness index of 74 compared to sucrose of 100 or fructose of 173. Um, glucose activates the cortex, the basal ganglia, certain other parts, but not the limbic system. Fructose stimulates the limbic system. So they act at two different, completely different places in the brain. And anything, anything that acts at the nucleus accumbens leads to dopamine release. And anything that does has in its extreme addiction. Pick your substance, pick your behavior. Fructose does it too. And we have the empiric data to show that this occurs in humans. Now, is there a threshold level though? Because fruit has fructose in it. You know, if you eat an apple, you're not stimulating those reward systems. So that comes into absorption, it comes into fiber, but also even if you're getting straight fructose, is there still some threshold level below which you're okay? Almost assuredly, yes. And it probably depends on who you are. Probably depends on your hepatic metabolism. Probably depends on various uh, phenomena that are going on. Probably depends on how insulin resistant you are as well. So for instance, let me give you an example. Latinos have a very specific poly set, two polymorphisms, not one, two, in their liver fat transcription machinery, in their liver. First one's called PMPLA3, patatin-like protein, phosphoprotein domain A3. Uh, and the other one is called SLC16A11. Both of these are involved in how the liver turns sugar into fat. And if you have the bad genotype for each of these, and Latinos, for whatever reason, seem to have the more frequency of those, you know, problem alleles in, in la the Latino population. If you have those, a little sugar makes a lot of liver fat. And if that's the case, then the more sugar you eat, the sicker you get, the quicker you get, if you, if you understand. Sure. Okay. Another thing that we know, there is an allele in the brain called the TAC1A allele. And if you have this allelic variation, you make 30% fewer dopamine receptors to start. Oh, interesting. In which case, that means you need more substrate more dopamine in order to occupy fewer receptors at baseline, hmm. which means you gotta eat a whole lot more sugar to get any sort of pleasure out of it. And those people have been shown to increase their rate of weight gain and increase their insulin resistance faster than even the general population. So without doubt, there are probably predisposing factors that some of them being genetic, some being epigenetic, some being very specifically environmental. It also depends on how much sugar and how much you know bad food is around you. You know we have food deserts in lower SES neighborhoods, um, and clearly they are the most susceptible, and they're also the ones driving health care through the roof. So you know we've got a problem. You've got to deal with the environment. So this isn't just genetic, although genetics play. A role, um, and we can't fix genetics anyway. So you know, let's fix what we can. Well, let's fix the environment. Yeah, there's clearly the the volume that people are ingesting. It wouldn't matter what your genetics are; it's still causing significant disease. The data, the data from the American Heart Association, and I signed on to this statement, said that we uh, adult women should be consuming no more than six teaspoons of added sugar per day, that's 25 grams, and adult men, nine teaspoons, that's 37 and a half grams. The median, the median for the United States today is 94 grams. So even if we cut our consumption by two thirds, we would still be over our limit. Wow. And for reference, how much is in one can of Coke? 39. 39. So I'll, that's... You're over. You're over. You're over. Right there. One can of Coke, you're over. Right. You're done. Yeah. And and also the size of the cans of Coke have changed dramatically. And the, the so that goes into the volume and the threshold effect as well. Well, so now we have the 20 ounce bottle, but you know, right. actually because of this problem and an attempt to try to, you know, uh, have a marketing ploy, um, Coke, as you know, has come out with its eight ounce can you know, have a little Coke, right. you know, they actually used Ant-Man, you know, to, oh, to, to uh, p pedal little Coke. No. Um, you know, look, anything that reduces consumption is good. Right. The question is, 
How do you do that en masse? How do you do that for everyone? Ultimately, the only way is to decrease availability. This is the iron law of public health. You decrease availability, which decreases consumption, which decreases health harms. The iron law of public health. True for tobacco, true for alcohol. Decrease availability. Now, you don't want to ban it. You know, you know, banning doesn't work. We tried that with alcohol, and you saw what happened. That was called the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment. We're not doing that again. Right. Okay. What you have to do is you have to make it hurt. You make it available, you make it hurt. You make it harder to get effectively. So that's this no notion of soda taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm for reduction in consumption, however it can be done. I think there's a way better, easier, much a uh, more effective way of dealing with this issue of effective availability. Get rid of the subsidies. Mm. So going back to the Nixon era and with his secretary Butts and how they sort of started this whole process to try and increase productivity and decrease cost, which maybe at the time made sense, but now in a whole different environment, we're stuck with those same subsidence, subsidies with a completely different connotation of what it means for our society. It didn't even make sense for Nixon. It didn't. Huh? It made sense for Roosevelt. So for Franklin, it made sense because we had two things going on at the same time. We had the Depression and the Dust Bowl in 1933. So we had a destitute population in the American Southwest, okay? They were dying of famine. Hmm. And the problem was all the food and all the food companies were in the Northeast. Right. So if you just dumped the food on a railroad car and sent it to the Southwest, by the time it got there, it'd be rancid. So they had to process it. So they had to basically take the wheat and process it, get rid of the fiber, put it in five pound bags, and then bake it up locally. Now, that made, and, and subsidize it to make it worth the while of the uh, American uh, food industry to do so. And in 1933, that made sense. And it even made sense through World War II. But after that, it stopped making sense. Yeah. But people realized, hey, I can make money at this. So we doubled down. And then... Nixon came along and he had to deal with political unrest, a lot of it. And he knew that fluctuating food prices caused political unrest. And so he told his agriculture secretary, Earl Rusty Butts, love that name, to make food cheap. Whatever it took to make food cheap. And so Butts said three things, row to row, furrow to furrow, get big or get out. That's what he said. Up to that point, we had paid farmers not to grow certain crops, to artificially inflate prices to benefit the farmer. That went by the boards. That was the end of that. What he now said was, you're gonna make it up on volume, okay? And we're gonna subsidize those foods in order to make them cheap. And we did. But that also led to monoculture. So. All the corn is now in Iowa and all the cattle are now in Kansas. And so, because there's no manure in Iowa, you gotta spray them with petroleum products which poison the water. And because there's no uh, uh, grain or um, uh, uh, you know grass in Kansas, uh, they're all on feedlots, you have to give them antibiotics which are, is changing our microbiome to make things even worse. In other words, we dissembled a food a uh, paradigm that actually worked for one that was cheaper, but way more dangerous. And we have to undissemble that. And the only way to do that is with policy. Right. And so many livelihoods depend on these subsidies now. And so much of our economy depends on these subsidies that it seems like it's too big of a problem to tackle. But if we, if we think that way, then, then this will just keep perpetuating. So we have to find a way to make the right foods less expensive right. instead of the wrong foods, so to speak, less expensive. And to get rid of this mono monocropping culture to get back to grasslands and rotational grazing. And because we're destroying our environment at the same time, 
and I guess that's part of what spurred you to go get your master's in law and start getting into the policy side of things and the advocacy side of things. Right. I, I had two questions. I went to uh, UC Hastings uh, College of Law for a master's in law. Um, I wasn't trying to get a JD. I, I don't want to be a lawyer, but I want to be able to talk to them. Right. Okay. So I had to learn the vocabulary. And I had two questions when I entered in 2012. When does a personal health issue become a public health crisis? And what are the legal doctrines that either support or refute that, especially at the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. And number two, how did tobacco get away with it for 40 years? Hmm. What was their playbook? Because ultimately the food industry is using the same playbook. Same playbook. So if we study tobacco, we can actually figure out what we ought to be doing here. And the fact is we're doing it. So yeah. we're, I, I'm very pleased and proud of how things have gone. And there has been movement and you can see the movement. Um, it takes a while. You know, cultural tectonic shifts do not happen overnight. Right. Give you an example. There have been four, count them, four cultural tectonic shifts in the United States in the last 30 years. I'll name them. Let's hear them. Bicycle helmets and seatbelts, smoking in public places, drunk driving, condoms and bathrooms. Hmm. 30 years ago, if a legislator had stood up in a state house or in Congress to propose any of those, then laughed right out of town. Okay? All of those were anathema. Nanny state. Right. Every single one of them, nanny state. Okay? Today, they're all facts of life. Yeah. We accept all of them. Okay? In fact, it's click it or ticket, and God forbid you see a kid drive, you know, riding his bike without a helmet. Okay? You call the cops. <laughs> okay? So that's that's what you should be calling cops for. <laughs> Not you know, gardening while black. Okay? <laughs> call the cops for the kid who's riding without a helmet. All right? The point is... Every single one of these required public education first, mm -hmm. okay? And then that softened the playing field and allowed for changes in legislation and litigation. This is going on now with food. Right. And we're probably, out of the 30 years, we're probably about seven years in. Oh, okay. I th you know, but it's going to take a while. It's still going to take a good 20 years before we're going to see, you know, the, the real change. And I'll tell you, you know what it takes? takes a generation. Yeah. And you know why it takes a generation? People need to die, unfortunately. That, that, and that's part A, okay? Yeah. The old people who won't accept need to die. And B, you have to teach the children because then when they get right. over 18, they vote. Right. That's what happens. Right. So we're doing it. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting questions to say, well, as that's happening, where are the lines being drawn? Because I, I've used Coca-Cola a couple times as an example. They're an easy example. But what about the fresh squeeze orange juice and the all natural fruit juice? And, you know, are, are those going to be protected more than some of the other sugary beverages? Yet they can all cause the same problem. So part of it is, is where are we going to draw the line? And some would say we have to go after meat because of poor epidemiological studies will say meat. So we need science to inform those decisions. Indeed. I couldn't agree more. We need science to inform those decisions. Yeah. Um, the citrus uh, growers are, you know, they're, 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 they're ballistic. They're right. absolutely ballistic. You know, they're saying, we didn't add any sugar to our uh, orange juice. That's true. They didn't. What right. they did was they took out the fiber. Right. Now, when you take the fiber out of a fruit, basically what you're left with is a soda. <laughs> um, here's why. The fiber in the fruit, and there are two kinds, there's soluble and insoluble. So soluble is like pectins or inulin, um, would hold jelly together. Insoluble fiber is like cellulose, okay? the stringy stuff in celery. Okay? So fruit has both. Now, when you consume the whole fruit, you're consuming both fibers, soluble and insoluble, and they work together. And what they do is they form a gel on the inside of your duodenum. After they pass the stomach, they set up the lattice work of the cellulose, coats the inside of the intestine, and then the, in, the soluble fiber, which are globular, plug the holes in that lattice work. And you end up with a secondary impenetrable barrier, which limits the rate and the amount of monosaccharides that are absorbed from the duodenum into the portal vein, which then go to the liver. So what you're doing is 
you're saving your liver. You're preventing your liver from having to deal with the onslaught, the tsunami of monosaccharides that come with an orange juice. Right. Okay, when you eat an orange. So the orange is okay. So what happens if you reduce the rate of absorption of monosaccharides in the duodenum? All right, where do they go? Well, they keep going. They go to the jejunum. All right, so what's in the jejunum that's not in the duodenum? The microbiome. So the duodenum has a pH of one because hydrochloric acid from the stomach. Okay, the pancreatic juice is secreted through the sphincter of Odi, which is in the middle duodenum. Okay, and then it mixes with the chyme. And so then by the time you hit the ligament of trites, which is where the jejunum starts, the pH has gone from one to 7.4. So the bacteria can't live at pH 1. Only Helicobacter pylori can live there. But at 7.4, they can all live. Well, they got to eat something. You know, you got 10 trillion bacteria, it's 10 trillion cells in your body. You got 100 trillion bacteria in your intestine. They outnumber you 10 to 1. Each of us is just a big bag of bacteria with legs. <laughs> they got to eat something. The question is, what do they eat? Well, they eat what you eat. The question is, how much did you get versus how much did they get? If you ate the fruit, if you ate the orange, what you're doing is you're feeding your bacteria. So even though you consumed it, you never got it. The bacteria got it. Now, all of these energy balance studies, all of these room calorimeter studies, all of these Kevin Hall studies that you know, are going to be lambasted in, about, in a few minutes downstairs at this meeting, okay, they're all measuring a unit. It is the human bacterial unit. It is not the human. Hmm. You cannot tell the carbon dioxide if it came from cellular metabolism of humans or cellular metabolism of bacteria. Okay? You cannot separate out those two. So it really doesn't matter. Okay? Because if you feed your bacteria, then they get healthy. Mm -hmm. And you get what's known as microbial diversity, you get fewer cytokines, and you get short-chain fatty acids from the um, uh, soluble fiber as it's fermented further down the colon. So fiber basically means that you're feeding your bacteria. So when you consume an orange, that fructose wasn't for you. Right. It was for your bacteria. Right. So I'm really not concerned about fruit. I am concerned about fruit juice yeah. because the insoluble fiber has been removed. So the science would say it's the same, yet the public opinion seems to be markedly different. So is that going to make it a, a bigger hill to climb to fight that than it would an added sugary beverage? Yes, yeah. uh, and it has been and will continue to be, and in part because the food industry points to that as the excuse. Yeah. That's their method for assuaging their culpability, yeah. is orange juice. Right. Okay? Orange juice is healthy. Anita Bryan said a day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. Oh, geez. Okay? You know, take yeah. a friggin' pill. <laughs> um, this is the problem. Yeah. And so, but, but it's the science that ultimately has to win out. But it takes a while. You know, when we're talking about educating the public, particularly a public that has been, shall we say, um, divorced from science for a long time and not taught science in schools and not taught the scientific method and not taught the scientific rationale and scientific thinking. Um, you know, this is a very uh, heavy lift. Well, and you can, you can state all those as they apply to the public. You could probably state all those as they apply to physicians and some scientists as well. No argument. And you can have documentaries that have been produced recently where a physician wearing a lab coat will stare into the camera and say, sugar does not cause diabetes. Yes. Dr. Neil Barnard, okay, I, I, I want to have a duel with you. <laughs> okay. I am calling you out. Okay. I will meet you anywhere you say. We will leave our guns at home. We will be armed only with the science and I am going to take you down. 
Well, I was trying to be a little clandestine and not come out with names, but apparently that's not going to fly here. No, so. it's not. <laughs> okay, Understood. I think he has poisoned America. And, and that's part of the problem. I mean, he's got a name. He's respected in many circles. And to hear him make a comment like that is just so confusing for the American public. Indeed. And so we're, we have to fight amongst ourselves in addition to fighting external influences in industry. And that just makes it a... That makes much. it even that much harder. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and so part of my job, if you will, is to ally the medical, the dental, and the dietary professions to speak with one voice. The food industry loves that we fight with each other, right. okay? It's how they win. If we actually were united, and we can be united, okay? So this is Low Carb USA, okay? I'll be very honest with you. I have nothing against low carb. I also have nothing against vegan. I really don't. I don't have anything against either of them. The only thing I have something against is the dogma. Right. That I have a lot against, okay? You know, Ornish has good data, you know, that works. And I believe it works. And the data show that it works. And you know what? So does low carb and so does keto and so does Atkins, when you do it right, when right. you do it right. And the point is there are a lot of diets that work. Mediterranean works, you know. Um, and in traditional what lifestyle? Japanese works. Right. In what lifestyle and what context? Because Ornish's studies was in a comprehensive lifestyle program. Totally. Mediterranean diet studies were in a certain lifestyle of the Mediterranean world. Where right? they can do it. Right. I totally agree. The point is that every single diet that works, and I don't care where you go, I don't care if you go to Greenland and do whale blubber. I don't care if you go to, you know, Africa and do, you know, the Maasai. I don't care if you do, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about agrarian cultures. I, you know, I just don't care. It's irrelevant. The point is that every diet that works on the planet is low sugar, high fiber. Right. Low sugar, so your liver doesn't get sick. High fiber, so you feed your bacteria. Right. Processed food is high sugar, low fiber. High sugar for palatability, low fiber for shelf life. Makes the food cheap, but turned it into consumable poison. So there's a rising tide of a low sugar, low fiber diet, the all meat carnivore, which is working very well for a number of people in, in a number of anecdotal reports. It Would, will improve insulin sensitivity. It will decrease insulin secretion. I used low-carb diets in my clinic for patients who had massive insulin resistance who could not be treated any other way. I know it works. I am. That's why I'm for it. Right. I didn't say I was against it. I'm for it. Um, but I'm for the other two. Yeah. And you know what? There are people who have familial hypercholesterolemia who have to eat the other way. All right? It depends on who you are. It depends on your genotype. depends on your disease burden. depends on your family history. depends on your environment. depends on a lot of things. Yeah. Point is, there's no cookie cutter answer. There's no one diet. Right. And the goal is to bring the right diet to the right person at the right time. But you can't do that if, you've, if you're all in on one diet. And in my clinic, we parsed people instead of lumped them. I think that's a great point. And even in a condition like familial hypercholesterolemia, you can't necessarily lump them into one category because you get someone who's got FH and is insulin resistant and pre-diabetic and high inflammatory markers. And now you're really stewing the pot for, for a bad outcome. Totally. So you have to address that possibly in a low carb situation as well. Point is target the pathology. Right. Always right. that's, that's physician's mantra, target the pathology. But if you don't know what the pathology is, then what are you targeting? Right. And that comes back to your talks about metabolic syndrome. I believe that's what you're talking about here yep. at this conference. And, you know, we define, we have our definition of the metabolic syndrome about the waist circumference and Garbage. hypertension. Garbage. And, and you say, Garbage. Well, all right, so let me, <laughs> you don't mince your words. I Garbage. like that. So tell me about that. Um, they're all manifestations of the metabolic dysfunction. They're all markers for the metabolic dysfunction. They are not the causes. Yes, they cluster together. No argument there. Different people have different ones. Different races have different predilections to different diseases. 
the reason is because it's not one thing, it's three. And I will describe that this afternoon, this morning. Um, it can be from obesity. I'm not saying it can't, but I think that's actually one of the rare causes of metabolic syndrome, not one of the common ones. It can be from stress because depressed people lose weight but have metabolic syndrome. Yeah. And with visceral fat. And finally, you can mainline it. You can basically fry your liver. And you can do that at normal weight and have metabolic syndrome. So I think there are three ways to get there. And I think there are different foodstuffs that can, and behaviors that can contribute to them. And I think that there are ways to parse those three pathways in order to be able to help each person deal with the problem that is, has caused theirs. But if it's one size fits all, it'll never work. Yeah. I like that approach. And, and the definition doesn't define the disease. The definition is basically for billing purposes more Indeed. than anything else. That's right. So yeah. understand this is metabolic dysfunction, and I'll even give it a better name. It's mitochondrial overload. Right. Metabolic syndrome is mitochondrial overload in whatever tissue you're looking at. That is metabolic syndrome, and we have the data to prove it. Yes, very good. I want to thank you, Dr. Lustig, for taking the time to join me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. I told you it was Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I quickly forget. Rob, thank you so much thank for joining you, me. Brett. My pleasure. Now, if our audience wants to learn more about you and hear more about what you have to say, where can we direct them? Well, there's a uh, website, robertlustig.com. There is eatreal.org. There will shortly be a for-profit website, uh, biolumen.tech, uh, about a for-profit uh, venture in an attempt to try to bioengineer a uh, solution to this crisis. Uh, and also um, numerous other uh, venues. There are YouTube videos. There's a YouTube channel with a lot of my stuff. There's the two books. There's Fat Chance and the Hacking of the American Mind. Um, you know, there's, there, there's ways to get the, the information. Absolutely. Oh, um, S Sweet Revenge is a PBS video that teaches people how to reverse their diabetes with real food. There are lots of ways. Well, this is a, a, obviously a big problem with real consequences, and I'm glad you're on the front lines helping trying to find a solution. So, Doing my best. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. <laughs>